I'm Jane and I serve on the faculty of Moore College in Sydney and over this past week at Moore College we've tried to get lots of resources online to be helping people during the COVID-19 crisis. So it might be that you're listening to, to, to this talk um, during that time or maybe um, in God's mercy the COVID-19 crisis has passed and you're listening to it then. It may be that you're listening to it by yourself or it may be that you're listening to it um, with a group of women online. Um, it was originally written for a group of women at Moore College and it's all about rightly handling the Word of God. So it's um, it's not a Bible talk in you know working through one passage. It's a training session and it's going to reference lots of Bible verses, lots of Bible passages. So it's, um, it's ideal probably to have um, um, pen and paper and you might want to write down those Bible references and look them up later. So it's a training session, it's going to go um, I assume for over an hour um, but obviously you can always pause and listen um, to some of it later. Um, all about rightly handling the Word of God. So Psalm 1, I'm going to read out Psalm 1. Psalm 1 says, Blessed is the one who does not walk in step with the wicked or stand in the way that sinners um, take or sit in the company of mockers, but whose delight is in the law of the Lord and who meditates on his law day and night. That person is like a tree planted by streams of water which yields its fruit in season and whose leaf does not wither. Whatever they do prospers, not so the wicked. They are like shaft that the wind blows away. Therefore the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous. For the Lord watches over the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked leads to destruction. Luke chapter 10 verses 38 to 42. As Jesus and his disciples were on their way, he came to a village where a woman named Martha opened her home to him. She had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet listening to what he said. But Martha was distracted by all the preparations that she had, that had to be made. She came to him and asked, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do the work by myself? Tell her to help me. Martha, Martha, the Lord answered, you are worried and upset about many things, but few things are needed, or indeed only one. Mary has chosen what is better, and it will not be taken away from her. Also in Luke, in the very next chapter, Luke chapter 11, verses 27 and 28. As Jesus was saying these things, a woman in the crowd called out, Blessed is the mother who gave you birth and nursed you. He replied, so Jesus replied, Blessed rather are those who hear the word of God and obey it. Well, this is a really important topic that we're looking at now, rightly handling the word of God. So what are we going to do? We're going to look firstly at why this topic is important. Secondly, we'll look at some common pitfalls we can fall into and how to avoid them. And thirdly, we'll look at some tips in handling the word of God rightly. But I hope that what you will see by the time that we finish, and I hope you're greatly encouraged by this, is that because of God's character, we have everything we need to handle the word of God rightly. Because of God's character, you have everything you need to handle the word of God rightly. And because of God's character, I have everything I need to handle the word of God rightly. So our first point, why is this topic important? Why is this topic important? There are many reasons why this topic is important. Here are six. We are to rightly handle the word of God because, firstly, God has revealed himself in his word. In scripture, God has given us an amazing gift. He reveals himself. His character, he reveals himself to you and I. And because he reveals his character, his purposes and plans are revealed. God has revealed himself in his word and so we want to understand it rightly because we want to know him. And knowing God means we come to understand what life is all about, who we are, what the purpose of life is, where history is heading. We understand that life is not circular, endlessly, meaninglessly, meaninglessly going around and around in circles, which is how some people understand life. 
um, some classically you know eastern ways to understand life but rather this life is heading to a sure and certain end point when God will bring all things under Jesus head so just like your words reveal you who you are and my words reveal me who I am the Bible reveals who God is what he is like and what his plans and purposes are for the world Therefore, it's really important we rightly handle the word of God. And the great encouragement is, because of God's character, God's word is understandable. God makes clear that he considers his word understandable. It's not unknowable, it is in front of you. God is not hiding away his word. And let that be a great encouragement to you. God's word can be on the lips of all, you know, adult and child alike. God has some secret things that are a mystery to us, yet God has revealed much to us, his people, that we may do them, that we may repent, believe, obey, delight in his ways. God's ways about salvation don't require solving you know, the mysteries of the universe. When we read scripture, the plain things are the main things and the main things are the plain things. So the plain things are the main things and the main things are the plain things. Not all of scripture is as easy to understand as other parts, but in terms of how we can be saved, it is plain. And with harder text sections of scripture, we are to interpret them with easier sections. And as Christian women, we have the Holy Spirit within us. So the spirit within us is the same spirit that is in God's word. We have the spirit within us that testifies to the truth of God's word. And we know that from our own experience, don't we? When we read scripture, it has the ring of truth to it. Now here are some verses from scripture that help us see God's character and our ability to understand scripture. So 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 13. And we also thank God continually because when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it not as a human word, but as it actually is, the word of God, which is indeed at work in you who believe. 2 Timothy chapter 2 verse 15. Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who does not need to be ashamed and who correctly handles the word of truth. Hebrews chapter 4 verses 12 to 13. For the word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword, it penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. Nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of whom to whom we must give account. Deuteronomy 29, chapter 29, verse 29. The secret things belong to the Lord our God, but the things revealed belong to us and to our children forever, that we may follow all the words of, of this law. Deuteronomy chapter 30 verses 11 to 14. Now what I'm commanding you today is not too difficult for you or beyond your reach. It is not up in heaven, so that you have to ask who will ascend into heaven to get it and proclaim it to us so we may obey it. Nor is it beyond the sea, so that you have to ask, who will cross the sea to get it and proclaim it to us so that we may obey it? No, the word is very near you. It is in your mouth and in your heart, so you may obey it. John chapter 5 verse 39. You study the scriptures diligently because you think that in them you have eternal life. These are the very scriptures that testify about me. Luke chapter 24 verse 45. Then he opened their minds so they could understand the scriptures. 2 Timothy chapter 3 verses 14 to 17. But as for you, continue in what you have learned and have become convinced of, because you know those from whom you learnt it, and how from infancy you have known the holy scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting and training in righteousness so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Ephesians chapter 1 verses 7 to 10. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, 
in accordance with the riches of God's grace that he lavished on us. With all wisdom and understanding, he made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in Christ, to be put into effect when the times reach their fulfilment, to bring unity to all things in heaven and on earth under Christ. Now that's a lot of verses, but it's just um, a number of verses just to um, get the idea that actually we have um, God's word and we can understand it. Imagery that the psalmist uses also helps to see that scripture reveals what God is like. So Psalm 119 um, verse 105, your word is a lamp for my feet, a light on my path. And also from Psalm 119 um, verse 130, the unfolding of your words gives light, it gives understanding to the simple so the word of God is not darkness and shadow, something that you know we are bogged down in. Rather, the, the psalmist says it's light, and that's because God is light. It shows us what we do not know, um, cannot know on our own. God's light gives us eyes to see. We also see in Isaiah chapter 55 that God's word accomplishes what it speaks. Therefore, God's promises are sure and certain. He's faithful. He's as good as his word. And God's character is revealed by the very fact that we can understand his word. God is not the sort of God who gives us warnings that we cannot understand. He doesn't use trickery. You know, what point is God warning us if we can't understand his warnings? We can understand them. Where God speaks, there God is. He is truthful straightforward he's not playing games with us and his word reveals his character also in that he's powerful and good God said let there be light in Genesis 1 and there was a lot of light his word is clear and powerful and good <clears throat> in John chapter 11 with the story of Jesus raising Lazarus from the dead um, we see um, just Jesus power like he, the, that his word is so powerful so just the end of that story, in, um, I'll read verses 43 and 44. When he had said this, Jesus called in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out, his hands and feet wrapped with strips of linen and a cloth round his face. Jesus said to them, take off the grave clothes and let him go. So the power of Jesus' word. When scripture is read out, um, <clears throat> We know what to do. We know how to respond. We know how to be obedient. This is the sort of God we have. And Jesus' view of Scripture also helps us see how God's character is revealed in Scripture. One example is that Jesus often appealed to the Old Testament to you know, resolve, settle a dispute. Therefore, it's authoritative. But it also means that it has a fixed meaning that others should have been able to recognize. Jesus doesn't say, well, it's you know, it's all nice that we have our own different interpretations. He appealed to Old Testament texts because they had meaning. He says to people many times in the Gospels, have you not read? Like that's said over and over. And we see in the New Testament that the apostles also appeal to the Old Testament. The Old Testament has meaning and we can see it. Jesus and the apostles are assuming that people including readers of the New Testament letters, so you and I, should have read the Old Testament and they should have been able to understand it and so be obedient to it. So God is not trying to trick us. When it says it's God's word, it really is God who is revealed, a God who is light, not dark, a God who reveals himself, who wants to be in relationship with us, who wants us to be obedient to him. He's not playing games with us. Secondly, this topic is important because we are to continue in the Christian life the same way we began. So we proceed in the Christian life the same way that we began, in dependence upon the gospel word of God. So 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 23 to 25. God's word is our foundation and it is God's word that ensures the building built upon that foundation i.e our lives and ministries is strong and straight so colossians chapter 2 verses 6 and 7 
excuse me, throughout scripture, we hear the call to listen to God's word and to do God's word, you know, letting his word shape our thinking, emotions and actions and guard God's good word. So we see that um, the idea of guarding God's word, guard, guarding God's word in Matthew chapter 7, verses 27 to 20, sorry, Matthew chapter 7, verses 24 to 27, James chapter 1, verse 22, and 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 20. Also, um, 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 23 to 25, I'll read that now. For you, you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable, through the living and enduring word of God. For all people are like grass, and all their glory is like the flowers of the field. The grass withers and the flowers fall, but the word of the Lord endures forever. And this is the word that was preached to you. Now, we all go to funerals, don't we? And at the moment with COVID-19, um, death is more, you know, on our minds. Um, there's people sick and um, we hear of deaths in Australia, but definitely around the world um, in countries at the moment like Italy and Spain and the United States. Um, this is a great reminder that all people are like grass. Um, we are all going to die. We are gone tomorrow. But the word of the Lord, it lasts forever. So hold on to what lasts forever. God's word lasts beyond the grave because God lasts beyond the grave. So Colossians chapter 2, verses 6 and 7, I'll read that. So then, just as you received Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live your lives in him, rooted and built up in him, strengthened in the faith as you were taught, and overflowing with thankfulness. And Matthew chapter 7, verses 24 to 27 says, Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house. Yet it did not fall, because it had its foundation on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on sand. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell with a great crash. James chapter 1, verse 22. Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 20. Timothy, guard what has been entrusted to your care. Turn away from godless chatter and the opposing ideas of what is falsely called knowledge. Well, um, third point, salvation, forgiveness and a clean conscience. Thirdly, this topic is important um, because the words of God are precious. They are the only words that can offer eternal salvation. They are the only ones that can offer forgiveness of sins. They are the only words that can offer a clean conscience. They are the only words that offer eternal life. They are the words that warn of God's judgment and they are the words that warn us of eternal hell. So, for example, 2 Thessalonians chapter 5 verses 1 to 10 is evidence of eternal hell. Um, it might be also that later on you want to read Psalm 51 and also um, 2 Samuel chapter 12 verses 13 and 14 and 1 Kings chapter 11 verse 4 and 1 Kings chapter 15 verse 5. In Psalm 51, all of David's sin was wiped away. God did what David asked for. David asked that God wash him, cleanse him, blot out his sin. And God did all that. He was washed, cleansed, and his sin blotted out. Um, yet, you know, I mean, David had committed adultery and he'd organized a murder. Um, he had lied. Um, so all that sin um, he was washed, cleansed, um, and his sin was blotted out. Um, yet we have so much more, don't we, than David, in that we live after um, Jesus has died and risen from the dead. Because um, we have seen the King. We have seen um, Jesus, who was sinless, take on our sin. So um, David couldn't take on our sin and, and die for us. Um, he, um, um, no matter how awful you think your sin is. For David, it was adultery and murder and lies. Um, Jesus' death on the cross was sufficient for your sin, no matter how horrendous 
you think your sin is and no, no matter how horrendous other people um, you know, say that your sin is, Jesus' death was sufficient for all of our sin um, and all the, the sin of us, our sin and the sin of people that um, we know, people that we're ministering to. We may feel um, you know, disgusted by people's sin, but Jesus' death was sufficient for it and um, it was enough. And the only way we know that, the only way that we know that Jesus' death was sufficient is if we handle the word of God rightly. We are not to preach ourselves, but Christ Jesus and him crucified. He will save people from their sins. He will forgive them. He will not hold their sins against them. How precious and wonderful and beautiful is that? Ultimately, it's God that we have sinned against. King David realized that. He um, God is the only one who can save us and others from eternal death and judgment. And he is the only one who can give us a clean conscience. Now, the power of a clean conscience is huge. It, it means we are less likely to live in fear, less likely to have insecurities. It helps us trust God more, not fear humanity and what they think of us. It helps us not avoid getting to um, know people. It helps us serve other people and not keep our distance from them. It helps us understand grace more. It helps us have so much more joy and delight in being Christian. The power of a clean conscience can probably be used a lot more in um, evangelism than many of us do. Um, that is such an attractive reality to offer to people. You know, all your sins are blotted out. You are washed clean. God doesn't see you and your sin. He sees Jesus. Um, Kevin Young says, so in his little booklet, The Art of Turning, on page 37, so Kevin DeYoung, um, quote Kevin now, we are not meant to live with a low level, persistent sense of guilt and shame. We are meant, as the Lord Jesus taught us, to daily confess our sins and know his favour. So end of quote. So that was from Kevin DeYoung, The Art of Turning. It's just a tiny little book, um, page 37. So Matthew chapter 1, verse 21, she will give birth to a son and you will name him Jesus, which means, you know, he saves because he will save his people from their sins. Um, Romans chapter 10, verse 17, consequently, faith comes from hearing the message and the message is heard through the word about Christ. Okay, well, what's um, the fourth reason why this topic is important? The fourth reason is because we are sinful. Um, and at times we don't want to handle the word of God rightly, do we? We want, to, um, we want it to say something else. And this topic is important because everyone around us is sinful also. So we won't always have Christians around us wanting to handle the word of God rightly. And there will also be false teachers around who by the very fact that they are called false teachers will not handle the word of God rightly. And they will seek us out to... Um, you know, to want to respond to their deceptions and falsehoods, you know, accept their deceptions and falsehoods. So this topic is a reminder to us that we are sinful and we won't always want to handle the word of God rightly, or we will prefer to hear what a false teacher is saying. It's very good and very helpful for us to remember that all of scripture is controversial. So not just passages like, you know, something like 1 Timothy 2 or 1 Corinthians 11, but all of scripture is controversial to us in that all of scripture is about God, not us. And ultimately, we want things to be all about us. So scripture is a reality check in that it teaches us and reminds us that life is all about God, not us. And so it's important we handle the word of God rightly to see that truth. Otherwise, we're very likely to interpret scripture to being all about us which really domesticates God, makes him how we want him. And that usually means he has no anger and, you know, so on. All of scripture is controversial because it's about God, not us. And this is a great reality check for us. Romans chapter 3, verses 22 to 24. This righteousness is given through faith in Christ Jesus to all who believe. There is no difference between Jew and Gentile, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and all are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. 
Um, it might be that you want to read 2 Peter chapter 2 later. 1 Timothy chapter 1 verses 3 to 5 says, As I urge you when I went into Macedonia, stay there in Ephesus, so that you may command certain people not to teach false doctrines any longer or to devote themselves to myths and endless genealogies. Such things promote controversial speculations rather than advancing God's work, which is by faith. Well, fifthly, the, the fifth reason um, why this topic is important is because it brings joy for the Christian. So when we handle the word of God rightly, it brings us joy. And this is um, connected to the topics, the reasons above. Not only does it give us a clear conscience, but, ha but we have a joy in being obedient to God, to his word, his ways. And this is seen all through the Bible. His commands are not burdensome. His commands are best for us. When we're obedient to them, we are living the way we, are we were created and redeemed to be. So God is not a, a killjoy. His ways are most freeing for us. Satan tries to deceive us into thinking obeying God's word means we're missing out, um, which is such a lie. God's words and being obedient to them, they lead to life, eternal life. Satan's words and being obedient to them lead to death, eternal death. God's words bring joy for the Christian. We see this with Jesus, who was fully obedient to his heavenly Father. We see this with the Apostle Paul and other Christians in the New Testament. Obedience brings joy for the Christian. Sin brings misery and destruction um, of ourselves, and our sin brings misery and destruction on others. When we're obedient to God's word, we live for God and others rather than ourselves, and this brings us joy. Psalm chapter 16, or Psalm 16, sorry, verse 11 says, You make known to me the path of life. You will fill me with joy in your presence, with eternal pleasures at your right hand. And I'm going to read an extended quote now from J.I. Packer. J.I. Packer says, I maintain that every encounter between the sincere Christian and God's word, the law from your mouth, however harrowing or humbling its import, brings joy as its spin-off. And the keener the Christian, the greater the joy. I know for myself what it is to enjoy the Bible. That is, to be glad at finding God and being found by him in and through the Bible. I know by experience why the psalmist called God's, called God's message of promise and command his delight and his joy and why he said that he loved it. I have proved, as have others, that as good food yields pleasure as well as nourishment, so does the good word of God. What is enjoyment? Essentially, it is a byproduct, a contented, fulfilled state, which comes from concentrating on something other than enjoying yourself. Bible study will only give enjoyment if conforming to our Creator in belief and behaviour through trust and obedience is its goal. Now that, that's a brilliant quote um, from J.I. Packer. No surprise, he's got a lot of brilliant quotes um, because he's written so wisely, such a godly man. Um, that's from his book, God Has Spoken, from pages 14 and 15. And if you look up that quote, you'll realise that there was all these Psalms references that I didn't read out um, and when I read the quote that are interspersed all through that quote that you may want to look up when you look up that quote. So that's from J.I. Packer, God Has Spoken. Any books that I quote throughout this training paper, I'll repeat at the end, okay? I'll repeat the author and the titles of the book. Okay, a sixth reason why this topic is important, because all the attributes of Scripture are under attack today. Now, the attributes of Scripture can be summarised, uh, you know, like with an acronym. Um, often they're summarised by SCAN, which is easy to remember, SCAN. Um, and some other people say SCANT, just add a, a T on the end. So sufficiency, clarity, authoritative, necessary, and one that some people add is truth. Obviously, um, scripture is truth. So sufficiency, clarity, authoritative, necessary, and truth. People say scripture, you know, um, is not sufficient. You know, we need something more, a better ethic on, you know, human sexuality. 
the New Testament says this, you know, but we need something for today, our, you know, our own sense of right and wrong. Um, people say scripture is not clear. You know, there are many ways to be saved. People say, you know, scripture is not authoritative. You know, of course, I sit over it. Why would I sit under a book, a book that is more than 2,000 years old, a book that, you know, is written by men? You know, people say a book is not, sorry, people say scripture is not necessary. You know, I don't need it to, to tell me how to live. And people say scripture is not truthful. You know, that's just lots of different people's you know, men's opinions. Some were nice, but some are not. How can they be truthful? How can I trust them? So this topic is important because all the attributes of scripture are under attack today, both from outside the church and also from those who um, identify as Christians, from those within the church. We need to make sure we handle the word of God rightly because God's word doesn't mean, doesn't mean whatever we wish it to mean. It comes from a consistent God who doesn't change. So it's important we handle it rightly. Okay, so there are six reasons why this topic is important. Um, now, what are some common pitfalls we can fall into, which means we don't handle the word of God rightly? Um, there are many. Here are seven pitfalls. Firstly, turning scripture against itself. Um, this is a really common one. So pitting the New Testament against the Old Testament, pitting Jesus against Paul, you know, for example, Jesus didn't say that. That's just Paul's opinion, okay? Um, secondly, turning scripture against God, um, which is similar to the point above. So pitting Jesus against Paul. So for example, Jesus didn't say that. That's just Paul's opinion. Pitting today's values against scripture. So for example, if the Bible is written today, it wouldn't say that. Um, you know, my friend won't become a Christian because of what's written in the Bible. My friend won't become a Christian because the Bible was written by men. You know, the Bible was written by men, um, you know, not God. So on. So, um, you know, turning scripture against God. Um, the third pitfall we can fall into is not dealing with, I wish it weren't in the Bible, but I will submit to it. Now, I think this is a real problem in the Christian circles I'm in. Um, so, you know, I wish it weren't in the Bible, but I will submit to it. So it's this reluctant acceptance. Now, if we, I think if we keep thinking this way, then one day we are likely not going to submit to it. But at any rate, God sees what our submission is like. Um, this attitude is not assuming that God actually knows what's best for us. And this attitude also assumes that God is not good. So be honest with God about how you're feeling about certain passages of scripture, but don't resign yourself to, okay, well, I will submit to it. Um, the fourth pitfall is um, saying more than scripture. So that tends to legalism. And the fifth pitfall is saying less than scripture. So that tends to um, liberalism. And the sixth pitfall is not understanding the doctrine of the clarity of scripture. So we can think the doctrine of the clarity of Scripture means that Scripture is supposed to always be clear, you know, that every part of Scripture is really clear and obvious to us. But that is not what we mean when we say clarity is an attribute of Scripture. Even Scripture itself testifies that some things in Scripture are hard to understand, you know, harder to understand than some other things. So, you know, the Apostle Peter says in 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 15 and 17, Peter says, our beloved brother Paul also wrote to you according to the wisdom given to him, as he does in all his letters when he speaks in them of these matters. There are some things in them that are hard to understand, which the ignorant and unstable twist to their own destruction, as they do the other scriptures. You therefore, beloved, take care that you are not carried away with the error of lawless people and lose your own stability." Um, seventh pitfall, not reading what scripture actually says, assuming what's in the text. So, you know, not reading slowly enough, not reading carefully enough, not spending enough time with our heads and our hearts in the text. Okay, so they were seven pitfalls. What are some helpful ways forward, you know, some tips? Um, there's lots, but here are 10, okay? So first of all, remember the first rule of biblical interpretation. So remember the first rule of biblical interpretation, and that is let scripture interpret scripture. Secondly, remembering God's character. So remembering God's character. So he is completely sovereign, he is completely good, and he is completely holy. Thirdly, 
the importance of both the author's purpose and also context, okay? So they're really in, important, um, they're really key if you want to handle God's word rightly. So remember both the author's purpose and also the context. You know, they are both, you know, king. They, often um, people say about, you know, context is king. But um, context um, is king or queen. And author's purpose is also, um, you know, king, queen. Fourthly, remember the tools you have to read the Bible. So we've got lots of tools to help us understand the Bible. So things including the author's purpose, the context, the structure, you know, linking words, um, you know, narrator's comments at times, vocabulary, different translations, the tone and the feel, you know, emotions that are happening, you know, sort of humor, is there sarcasm happening? Um, is there repetition? Is there quotations? Is there allusions to other parts of scriptures? You know, what type of genre is it? Is it poetry or is it narrative? Um, where are we in salvation history? Um, you know, questions like that. And Nigel Bynan and Andrew Satcher's book, Dig Deeper, is really, really helpful to understand um, how to read the Bible, how, how to handle it um, just with these different um, tools, how to handle these, how to use these tools to, um, um, to rightly handle the word of God. Um, the fifth tip is ask good questions of the Bible text. Now, good questions help us to slow down and notice what is actually in the text. Therefore, good questions help us to be better readers of the Bible. And if you're a better reader of the text, it means you're handling the word of God rightly. Slow down. Now, here are some types of questions to ask of the Bible. Okay. So first of all, generic questions of any text. So sort of generic questions, some examples would be, some easier examples, you know, they're ideal no matter if, um, if someone is a Christian or not, or if they're younger or older in age. Some generic questions are like, who are the characters? What is the tone, mood of the passage? What does it tell me about God? What does it tell me about humanity? What is something I think is unusual? What is something, um, you know, what is it? Um, what is something controversial in this passage? What what don't I understand? What is something new for me? What is something I can be thankful to God for? What can I pray for from this passage? Do we get any clues as to what type of genre this is? Do we have any historical markers in the passage? You know, so some harder questions that would be um, generic would be: What is the context? What is the author's argument structure? So that's you know ideal for an epistle. How does this Old Testament passage point to Jesus? What is the big idea of this passage? Why do you think this passage is in Scripture? What would we miss if it weren't here? Um, how would I finish this verse? You know, say for example, Peter finishes the verse this way. Is that how I would have finished the verse? Um, secondly, um, three basic building blocks to any Bible study. So first of all, we looked at just some generic um questions. Um, some other types of questions are basically these three basic building blocks to any Bible study. So observation, meaning and application. So observation, the question to ask there is what does the text say? Meaning, or sometimes it gets, you know, get called, gets called interpretation. What does the text mean? And then application. What does the text mean for us? for me, for Christians, for the world, okay? So observation, meaning, application. What does the text say? What does the text um, mean? What does the text mean for us, okay? Please do not underestimate the power of good questions. Just like in conversations with someone, asking good questions and listening to their answers is so important. So important in terms of getting to know them, how they are. If we don't ask questions of someone, if we don't listen to them, we are not really in a relationship with them. Okay, the sixth tip out of our 10 tips, the sixth one is remember you have all you need to rightly handle God's word. So God's spirit, the Bible, God's character, he wants you to know him and he wants you to share what you know about him with others. So that is an encouragement. You have other Christians to help you understand the Bible, um, you know, ones from church history, ones that are alive today, 
um, maybe that you've never met, but you know, that are online, you know, got lots of resources online, different books, different talks. And very importantly, for those of you who are Christians, you know, those in your local church and other um, Christian friends and maybe family members, if you're blessed that way. Um, the, the second tip, uh, the, sorry, the seventh tip is pray for understanding and discipline. So prayer, um, number eight, be thankful to God for what you read. Um, and being thankful will help remind you that God's work is best, God's word is best for us. Everything around us, everything is telling us that God's word is not best for us and in fact is dangerous for us. And that's much more the narrative now that it's not just, you know, some people, you know, previously often in society were just apathetic about God's word, but now much more the narrative and the rhetoric is actually it's really dangerous for us. So as we read God's word, it's good to be thankful for what we have read. Um, so we're reminded that, you know, God's word is good for us and in fact it is not dangerous for us. Um, number nine, repent. So face God. Don't be like the fool and reject God, but um, face God, repent, be wise. Um, and lastly, number 10, seek to be obedient to God's word and delight in it, which will involve sharing it with others, both Christian and others. So be encouraged by the power of a godly life, um, you know, which is very attractive. If you love people deeply, even the person who isn't Christian, who you know hates what you believe about certain things will recognize that you love and serve others. If you seek to be obedient to God's word, you will end up delighting in it, and this will be so much um, part of you. It will shine out of you. It will be reflected in what you think, what you say, what you don't say, how you act, how you don't act, your priorities. God's ways will you know ooze out of you. Um, the book of Titus tells us that the purpose of us being saved is to live good lives. We're created to do good works. And being obedient to God's word, we will indo indeed do these good works. It will mean that God's ways will be our ways. Um, and that, my friend, um, or um, I probably don't know you, um, is the mark that you have handled the word of God rightly. Thank you. Now, I just want to mention um, some of the um, resources I used for um, writing this talk. So I, um, I talked about um, J.I. Packer. So um, J.I. Packer's book, God Has Spoken, and um, that's an older book, and I used the 2016 um, edition. That's, um, that was the, that's the most academic book that I used, um, but it's still accessible. Um, it changed my life. It's a brilliant book. Um, a really helpful book, um, which is written for women, um, and it's in a series of um, a, a series of different doctrines. Um, this one's by Kerry Fulmer. Um, so it's the good portion, scripture, the doctrine of scripture for every woman, and that's published by Christian Focus and Kerry. Um, wrote that 2017 and it's um, part of a series um, of the plan is for there to be 10 different um, books in the series on 10 different doctrines. Um, Kevin DeYoung, Taking God at His Word, Why the Bible is Noble, Necessary and Enough and What That Means for You and Me. So that's an easy, quick, clear book to read and extremely helpful on the doctrine of Scripture. So that's Kevin DeYoung, Taking God at His Word by Crossway, 2014. Also, I mentioned Kevin DeYoung's, um, the, the mini book, um, The Art of Turning. So Kevin DeYoung, The Art of Turning from Sin to Christ for a Joyfully Clear Conscience. And that's published by 10 Publishing. And that's 2017. Um, and I also mentioned Nigel Bynan and Andrew Satcher's book, Dig Deeper. That's an older book in 2005 but I just think that's a really helpful resource and it's a good book to buy it will help you a lot if um, if you're a woman that is preparing to write Bible studies or even as you're um, preparing to be um, a member in your Bible study group that's a really helpful book to have a um, to buy so it's by Nigel Bynan and Andrew Satch could dig deeper tools to unearth the Bible's treasure and that's some IVP 2005 
Yeah. So, yeah. Thanks very much for listening. <laughs>